Good afternoon, traders. Live from Indianapolis and streaming across the world, this is Shane with Futures.io. We're pleased to have you here, and thank you for joining us for our 418th webinar event. Over at Futures.io, our Battle Station Challenge is well underway, but it's not too late to join and be eligible for some big prizes. All you have to do is share a picture of your trading desk. The entry is free. Also, if you post a selfie along with your trading desk, you're automatically eligible for a 50% discount off of Futures.io Elite Membership. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome our very own Lance Stranahan, AKA Lancelot Trader. Lance is a 13 year retail trading veteran. He's gonna share some stuff uh, on the NQ today. After the presentation, we're gonna have a Q&A session. And as always, the event is being recorded and it'll be posted on the Futures IO website and YouTube within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, speaking of YouTube, our channel's got over 400 videos covering just about any trading topic you can think of. Check it out, smash a few like buttons, Share it with your friends and definitely subscribe for all the latest updates. And then finally on social media, you can follow us on Facebook and also on Twitter at Futures.io. And now please join me in welcoming Lance Stranahan. Lance, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. You know, I've spent some time watching it. I'm an ES trader, but uh, I've spent some time watching it. It is pretty wild. I think the, the title is Taming the Beast is Entirely Apropos. Uh, really looking forward Great. to the presentation, man. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Shane. Uh, this is Lance Stranahan. Go by the handle on Futures.io, Lancelot Trader. And I uh, hope everybody's doing great today. I have had a thread on there for since about 2011 called the Crude Dude Trading System. Uh, and mainly because I was trading crude oil when I started it. Uh, but now I've transitioned more into NQ the last several years, but being a little bit of a procrastinator, I haven't uh, changed the title of the thread. I think I'm going to get around to that though. <laughs> so it'll probably be a new NQ journal or something like that. But anyhow, uh, let's get right into it. Why trade NQ? What are some of the good things about it? Uh, well, one of the things is it can move uh, hundreds of ticks very quickly. A lot of times when you're in a trade and some instruments to move as much as this one does, you can be sitting in there a long time, be tolerating a lot more risk events, lots of different things. Um, so somebody with a small account and you want to get some big winners, this is something that will give you those moves. Uh, also, as far as setups that I like, uh, you can usually get a lot of opportunities on any trading day or at least during a trading week. And the more good opportunities, the more great setups you get, the better chance you have of making some winning trades. Uh, I happen to do both. Uh, some scalping, but I also do moderate size targets and also some big runners. So I have kind of a hybrid system. I'm going to talk a little bit about when's the best time to go for some scalps. To me, scalping is on NQ generally never less than 20 to 25 ticks and uh, with about the same size stop loss. I really think if you go much smaller stop loss than that, you're going to probably get stopped out a lot. Um, it's something depending on your schedule that you can really trade uh, around the clock. I mean, some some instruments are kind of dead in the U.S. afternoon session. NQ still makes a lot of good moves. Um, I've even seen some decent things in the Asian session. And for those who live in Europe and all that, they could uh, probably see some really good moves in the European session. So I think it offers something for you know anyone's schedule really. And of course, you can start trading it in micro contracts, which I think in this particular case is a very good idea if you're transitioning to a live uh, scenario because um, NQ can be pretty risky until you really get to learn it. Um, all right, why would you not wanna trade it? What are some of the downfalls of trading NQ? Well, in my opinion, there's many times where it's just too volatile to trade safely. Uh, I have sometimes days during the morning session where I've had to stay entirely out of the market. It's just moving in such a fashion that I wouldn't want to trade it. Um, also, it's a very bouncy instrument. What do I mean by that? Well, you can be going in a trade, you're up you know, a good amount, everything's looking good. You don't see any obvious support or resistance in your way. And all of a sudden 
it whipsaws against your position and you find yourself taking heat, you know, and you're almost getting stopped out and, you know, you're like, what, what happened, you know, and it's just like, I'm going to show maybe why some of those things happen that most people aren't aware of and why it bounces like that and what it's actually hitting and we'll get to that. But, uh, and, and you can be in what seems to be a really strong trend. Like some days I start out and I'm like, I'm definitely only a seller today. You know, the thing's selling off. It opened up, you know, 300 points down. It's just like, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, I'm not taking that long. That's, that's just going to be a, you know, it's just retracing. It's not really a valid. And then before I know it, it's moved up three, 400 ticks long. And it's like, what happened? <laughs> so lots of, you know, things that are a little disconcerting. It, it shouldn't really, in my opinion, be traded with a small stop loss, okay? Uh, you're gonna get stopped out a lot if you're going for like 15 ticks, 10 ticks, just the very way it moves most of the time. Again, in slower times, maybe I'll go 20, 25 ticks in when I'm scalping or something, but generally I like 40 ticks. I don't really go much above that. I don't wanna take any more risk. And for some people, 40 ticks is maybe too much risk for them. That's what I'm comfortable with. It gives me uh, some little bit of room for these trades to work out. Um, again, due to the way it moves, due to uh, the speed it moves, a lot of times your traditional lagging indicators aren't gonna really help you. By the time they give you a signal, it's like, you know, you've missed a lot of the move. So, technic you know, technically and analyzing everything, it's just, it's very spontaneous, you're in the moment, and uh, I, I, again, that's not gonna work for a lot of people. And there's a learning curve, you know, it's taken me several years to really figure out some of these anomalies, some of these things I'm seeing, some of the uh, patterns. So it takes, you know, screen time and practice. I wish, and, you know, there was an indicator that said, hey, buy now, sell now, but to me, it takes a little bit of work to learn how this thing moves. Okay, why listen to this Lancelot Trader guy, this uh, forum guy? Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I bring to the table, why I may have some valuable information you could possibly incorporate into your own system that might be helpful. Uh, I've only traded basically NQ now for the last four years. And I think if you're watching just one instrument, you know, several hours a day, every day for four years, you're going to learn something, hopefully. Uh, and so I've seen pretty much everything it's going to do. You know, every little fake out, head fake, whipsaw pattern, market condition, every type of thing it can do. So I'm not really surprised by anything I see. Um, and here's something that I recommend everybody do. I record all my sessions, I review them. And this has actually helped me learn so many things, um, put together a lot of patterns that I know and which market conditions they work the best at. Recording my sessions have given me where I see those moments during the day. I call that sweet spot where you're getting just the right momentum. You're getting in with just you know the right little, low risk entry, you, you know, you can, there's, so, you know, I'm waiting to have everything line up that I've watched and seen over and over and over for four years. Uh, and again, I treat this like an athlete would treat something, getting ready for an event maybe. I've studied charts for hours, I've practiced on replay, because this is a very fast paced instrument. So, you know, I was pretty good at some of those first person shooter video games. Well, let me tell you, if you're a gamer and you like fast paced uh, action and you need to click that mouse at the precise moment, this is the instrument for you. If you like slower times, it can give you that too. But uh, I've done a lot of practice and uh, I've taken everything over these last few years and I've really simplified it. I've taken out everything unnecessary. We've all gone through those holy grail where you're trying this out, this indicator out, this bar type out, this thing. And I've made it so simple that a lot of people are gonna be disappointed. They're gonna go, wow, this is, 
I was hoping for some really, you know, incredible indicators, some incredible techniques that I've never seen before. The setups themselves and everything is pretty simple. The art, the art of this lies in being able to read the market conditions, being able to read the momentum, and being able to know those moments. If there's any real difficulty to the system, that would be it. Uh, but the setup, setups themselves, when you see them, they're pretty basic. And when you practice and you learn, you'll see a lot of times when it's those right moments to take those setups. I'm gonna talk about this briefly. I don't wanna get too boring here. Uh, a little bit about my trading background. This could be also interpreted as a cautionary tale. Don't do necessarily what I did for many years. Uh, hopefully, if you see videos like this and other things, you'll learn uh, maybe to get on the right footing early on. But I started 15 years ago with Forex. Uh, what happened is a guy took me to this seminar for a software company called Forex Made Easy. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's from Wise Trade. They had these little green lights and the red lights kind of told you. It was like 3,000 or more. And yeah, Genius here bought it. Yep, I bought the software. I, I hear. I bet you're laughing. Don't laugh. It's not that funny because it should have been called uh, "Losing Money Made Easy." Okay, because uh, actually, without really knowing how to trade, I managed to lose a pretty large sum of money using this little red light, green light. It just didn't quite, you know, work for me. But I was initially drawn to scalping, like a lot of you know, traders are. I wanted the smaller targets, traded mostly the euro dollar and the euro yen. Uh, scalping to me was going for like 10 ticks, 10 tick stop loss. That seemed to work pretty good. A lot of the people I learned from some of my early mentors taught scalping techniques. Uh, there was this guy I found on a thread called, uh, it was called the Cyrox Rainbow Scalping. <laughs> and it used a one second chart. Uh, I don't recommend trading NQ with a one second chart, okay, don't, and, and then uh, moved on from that after I went to some live seminars and spent a lot of money on that with this guy, and then uh, I went to something called Logical Forex, which, you know, if you go on my thread, you'll see I used some of those charts and indicators for many years, uh, and that was originally set up for a one range chart, again, don't recommend that for NQ. I changed it to a two range chart and I did learn some things from this uh, that I still have incorporated today. So the logical Forex had some very valid lessons uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I no longer use the software indicators, but, and I switched to a five range chart for some of my executions, although I'm always looking at some higher time frames as well. But I got out of Forex mainly because I've had a few bad experiences. You'd go into a trade and the spread would widen, which means you'd go into a trade and you'd be like five pips down before you even did anything. And this would happen and then you get brokers and a lot of funny things went on. And I decided, you know, I tried futures and I really liked it. I'd go into a trade and I would be, you know, even, which is I didn't have this, you know, automatically down several ticks when I went into a trade. And I started with crude oil mainly. I really liked it. And there was a period where I was doing pretty well. It was, again, mainly scalping 10 ticks and had a couple of things. Sometimes I'd catch a runner, especially around the crude oil report. And, uh, and then a few years back, strangely enough, it started moving a little bit differently. It wasn't really had the same momentum. There were a lot of days that were just exceedingly slow. And I started looking at E-minis, the various ones, the, the Russell, uh, you know, the S&P. And I saw these NQ charts and I just saw these incredibly big moves. And I thought, I know I'm a scalper, but geez, some of these are happening really quickly. And I got into NQ, but it wasn't a very smooth ride. I, I got tremendous amount of losses on it. Uh, quit many times, sometimes for months at a time. So yes, endured many years of failure. Uh, and by many, I mean quite a bit. Um, then that nice thing began to happen. I began to stop losing money. Ta-da. That's a nice feeling when you're finally, when you're not making any, you're breaking even. And you know, it'd be kind of funny conversation if you told someone, you know, hey, I've, 
I'm doing pretty good. I stopped losing money. And they'd be like, well, great. Uh, that sounds great. How, when, how long did it take you to do that? Uh, 10 years. What? You know, <laughs> you know, and imagine telling your spouse that, you know, you've been at this computer for like six hours a day and they're doing it for years. And she says, you know, how, how are you doing? Well, I'm not losing money anymore. She'd probably look at you like, I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie The Shining. You know, and, and Jack Nicholson has been supposedly writing a novel and typing for like, you know, thousands of pages. And sh his wife finds it and he's written the same w sentence over like that's the kind of look you'd get if you said, yeah, 10 years, I've stopped losing money. I know it sounds silly, but uh, that's what some traders go through. And it shouldn't have taken me this long. I mean, I had a pretty valid system a lot earlier, but there were other factors, which I'm going to tell you about. But then I started uh, making small amounts of money and my statements were, you know, getting positive. And in the last year and a half, I've made some tweaks and it's been starting to go quite well. I'm finally, you know, at that stage where I had hoped I would finally start to approach. Um, so I'm going to touch on this briefly. I want to get into NQ. I don't want to like go too much in this. I have a whole video and I'll tell you in the next slide how you can watch it that really goes into detail how I corrected some of these things. But this is kind of why I failed for many years. Um, it's, you know, I had a workable system that I think if I gave it to somebody that was emotionally a little more stable, they may have done quite well with it. But one of the big things was this unable to stop at a daily loss limit. You know, you tell yourself, I'm only gonna lose $200 or whatever it is, and many days I did it, and then some days it would be like, oh, you know, I just couldn't walk away. You know, I'd keep going, and I'd lose, and I'd lose, and then I'd have to double up on my contracts, and I'd try to get back to even. Some days I'd get back to even. Other days it was a disaster. Blow out the account, uh, you know, just really gets really just destroy my account. Um, and it all came about from not being able to really control emotions and impulses. Uh, something I never knew I really had that problem. In most of the things in my life, I've always been pretty disciplined. You know, I've done athletics. I was even in bodybuilding where you have to get diet, like really eat these like super strict diets. And I've uh, always been able to be pretty disciplined. But when it came to just walking away from a computer, I mean, I would never think I'd be like the guy in the casino. You know, you've seen the guy, he's losing, and they're like, sir, I think, you know, it's time to leave. No. no. It, it hit me again. Let's go. Come on. And then finally, he gets dragged out by some big giant guys in a suit. You know, they drag him out of the casino. See, in, in trading, that doesn't happen. There isn't going to be some big giant guy to drag you away and, sorry, sir, put the mouse down and walk away from your computer, you know. So, you know, hopefully there's programs, but... You know, a guy that's a SIM trader, if you're just a SIM trader and you're listening to this right now, you're like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? You know, you don't understand the emotions and the feeling until you've lost money and how you just, it's really hard to explain. And then you get in this revenge trading where you're trying to get back at the market. You're trying to make your money back. And what happens is you're not objectively perceiving the market conditions. So sometimes the reason I'm losing is the market's too volatile. Something's wrong but you're no longer looking at it objectively, you know? Um, so again, if you're really interested in knowing how I overcame all this, how I inserted rules into my system and how, what, you know, little techniques I did, go, it's on the futures IO, it's on my thread, the crude dude oil trading system, go to page 113, if you wanna write it down or review this at some point and scroll down, it's, I, I'm only mentioning this, some people have watched it and they say, you know, I went through the same thing you did. I had this problem it kept, and I love what you said and it helped me. So some people found it helpful. So if you want to go more into that, I don't want to spend all day on this, but there you go. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about my pretty simple pre-market open preparation. Obviously, I check for any news events that are happening that day. You don't want to get into something, you know, right before news is coming out if it's, a, you know, one of those things that has a pretty high impact. One of the things I've learned is you'll see sometimes at 10 o'clock, the Federal Reserve guy is testifying or he's talking. Those are the worst times to be in a trade. The guy will be saying something like, 
well, we're going to keep the interest rates down for the next year or so. And everybody's like, yeah. And they, you know, pile into the market. The thing starts shooting up 100 ticks. And then all of a sudden, while he's talking, he'll say, but we're seeing some inflation on the horizon. And all of a sudden, it just dives down. And it's just not a good time to be in the market. So I avoid those, those times. Um, I always check where the NQ and the Dow futures are in the morning. Are we down like 500 points on the Dow? Is the NQ looking bad? Uh, because that could be one of those sell-off days. And some of your most rewarding days are these massive sell-offs in NQ, especially if it retraces up, you know, and it starts looking like it's moving up and then it resumes that downtrend. I mean, that's some of your really huge runners. So I really want to get a little idea uh, and then I map out my support and resistance. Now, this can be an individual thing. Mine is kind of simple. I just draw these little horizontal lines over highs and lows. I look for maybe areas that were breakout areas. If you're using volume profile and it's working good for you and you can really uh, you put that into there, you have your own system that's effective. Go ahead. I'm not going to get really into, you know, I think that's an individual thing. I, I have a very simple thing. And it, in most of the areas I map out seem to really turn out to be exactly where price turns or bounces or something. So uh, it, I just kind of eyeball it, really. I look for something called gap areas. These are places on the chart where you'll see there's no swings, there's no real pockets of support and resistance. When price is moving with some momentum, excuse me, momentum, and it gets into those areas, that's another place you can see really big moves. Um, and then I put together a flexible basic trade plan for the session, kind of like, uh, you know, if this goes long, what am I going to do? Where are some of the places I'd like to buy from? Where am I a buyer? Where am I a seller? This is flexible because after the opening 30 minutes, I may have an entirely different plan. Um, what I'm going to do now is show a brief little video. It's just kind of, kind of some of my typical trades I take, 40 tick moves with a 40 tick target. These are kind of my bread and butter trades on an average momentum day. And I'm going to show it just so you can, when I start explaining the setup, start explaining this a little more depth, you kind of get an idea what it looks like. There's a lot of these on my, uh, I hope everybody can see that all right. Um, this is like some typical trades. This first one, isn't really totally typical. It, this is in real time, by the way. You can see how fast this is moving. That's my tick strike, a little order flow indicator. It makes a little ticking sound, shows these bars. Um, but this is real time. That's a 40 tick target, trading three contracts there. Um, you can see I'm, I, I'm usually looking at a five minute chart, a two minute chart, at the same time, I'm looking at this. This is a five range chart. Now, you can see this curling up. This is like typical type of trade I like. Uh, I've mapped out, these are some of these little swing areas. I just draw these little lines and I'm constantly moving them throughout the session. Sometimes they no longer are in play. They no longer, but I'm generally, because price reacts off of a lot of these swings. And that's something I learned from Logical Forex, which was a program that automatically drew uh, swing levels and things like that. Um, so I'm pulling back to this area. I'm looking for like a little re-entry. It formed like an A formation, trying to go in when it gets through this little yellow dotted line, which is a 30 EMA. And there's another 40 tick target before we get to this next level of support. So again, you can see that's basically a scalp, even though it's 40 ticks, because it only takes a few seconds. Here's another one. Here's an area I really marked with a thick line because I had seen throughout the session price interacted with this area many times. And I got in a little late because I love my stop to be above the swings. It loves to retest swings. You can see it retested this little level, and now it's moving back down. So I just showed that because, again, I'm going to talk about some of these things. I just wanted you to get an idea, and also get an idea of some people saying 40 ticks. Well, that's that's a pretty big, you know, target. On NQ during the morning, it's not really hard to hit at all. 
And if you got at least a couple of contracts or even a couple of micro contracts, it's a, it's a nice little pop. All right, let's get back to this. Um, okay, this is just an example of how I mark up some of my charts. This is a 30 minute chart. This is actually, I did this this morning. Um, you can see if you zoom out, you can get quite a bit of uh, days in here. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, marking out these highs from February 28th, uh, where we were uh, here on March 16th, some of the lows here on March 7th. So I'm just kind of drawing little lines. My 30 minutes giving me an overall deal, you know, the macro trend, some of the things, some of the levels that I'm going to be. And what I do is because sometimes I'm not looking at this chart while I'm trading. So on some of these important levels, I might be looking at my five range and my two minute, and I totally forgot we're at the high of the day. I'm going to set little sound alerts. If you have that in your platform where you can set little sound alerts, it's a great thing to know when right before you're going to take a trade, if you hear that, say, well, wait a minute, I'm at the high of that previous high. This may not be somewhere I want to go long or, you know, it's a good idea to do that. Um, I, met, I mentioned something about gap areas. When I woke up this morning, this is a five range chart. This happened overnight on the NQ. We had a real big push like at about two or three in the morning. Now what happens here is this creates this gap. If you see this line here to here, there's virtually nothing going on here that's gonna slow price down if we start moving up. And with enough momentum, you can uh, easily, this is hundreds and hundreds of ticks here. I can see sometimes NQ will race up to something like this in a fairly short period of time when there's no, so I'm always looking for these. Now, the reason I have this marked purple is when I'm gonna be in a trade and I don't necessarily write all these levels down, I know when I get to a purple, I have a pretty significant gap till my next level of support and resistance. So that's when I'm in the heat of the moment. I don't wanna look and, you know, and scroll through my charts and go, wait, is this an area where I, I think there's a gap. Well, I just color code it. And in some of these little swing areas that I think price could bounce, but it's not gonna necessarily react that strongly, I color code their line yellow, and I call that a speed bump. A speed bump means it might react, but it's not gonna really probably reverse it or anything. Okay, now this is something I really wanna stress this part of the webinar because it's something, and I've talked to a lot of traders and I've seen a lot of journals, a lot of people don't really do this and that's fine. It's just something that I couldn't really have my system without. So this is very important. Real-time swings and support and resistance. Uh, during a trading session, support and resistance levels can form that are difficult to detect on higher time frames. In other words, I can look on a five minute chart and things and I'm not gonna see these little real time pockets of swings of some of the stuff you saw already that I draw these lines on. I have found a five range chart is good for showing these areas. Um, if you go much lower time frame than that, you're gonna get noise, lots of noise. Um, so uh, five range seems to be I mean, you might have a Renko chart where you can really see these two or something that leaves little wicks that you like, but I prefer this because um, it just works for me and I get these nice little A and V patterns and W and uh, V pattern. So A and M, V, W, these letters are what you're going to see are my price pattern setups. If you can remember those letters and you'll see, and you see them forming, that's when you know it's heads up. Okay, so these real time swings and price congestion areas can result in profound reactions when hit by price. Why is that important? Because if you don't see them and you haven't marked them off on your chart, you can go into a trade, and this is particularly true of NQ more than almost any instrument I've ever seen. You'll be in a trade, and like I said earlier, all of a sudden you will hit something that you do not see and your price will all of a sudden start bouncing the opposite way, you know? And you'll be like, dude, what just happened? And if you want to avoid the dude, what just happened syndrome, 
uh, it's good to identify these areas because otherwise you're in a winning trade. All of a sudden it bounces down, you're taking heat, and then your heart's pounding like, oh my God, I thought I was winning this trailer. And, and you don't know why. Why did it do that? And then it gets back to uh, even and you get out of the trade and suddenly, boom, it goes on to hit your target. And you say, damn, I, uh, I was winning. And, and, and I'm only saying this because I've done that like a hundred times. So, uh, so now I don't get too stressed out when I, and, and if it's not a real serious area, I just expect these bounces. And it's a lot easier to manage a trade when you know what's going to happen on the way to the target. Hope that makes sense. So my system relies heavily on drawing lines at these levels, constantly adjusting them throughout the trade session. There's times when something will rip right through your little support and resistance levels. It's no longer valid. So I move my little lines around to the new swing and to new things. And it sounds like maybe a hassle. I got to draw on my chart and move them around. Yeah, I do it because it works. On my two min, my bigger time frames, I don't move them as much. Those are more valid, bigger support and resistances. So I don't really do that much adjusting on those. And again, like I said, where there's large gaps with no support and resistance, I showed you some of those gaps already. And this is kind of just an idea of what I'm looking at. Usually I have the two minute and five minute on one monitor and this blown up on my main monitor, the five range chart. And this is the one I'm gonna actually execute and spot certain patterns and pullbacks and things like that. I'm looking for more trend and other uh, factors from these. I like my two minute bars to be above the 30 EMA, which is this yellow dotted line. I prefer that uh, to be in that trend with the two minute chart. Uh, and of course, at the five minute, even more confirmation. That's not a hard, fast rule. There's plenty of action in between here till we even get up there. You know, and if you wait for everything to always give you a signal, and I'd like to give you more precise confirmation than that, but you know, if I'm seeing higher highs and higher lows and these V patterns and W patterns forming and price moving with some real momentum because it just bought off this level, I'm not going to wait till maybe my two minute crosses above here. Um, talking real quick. Okay, what are the main principles of the system? What are some things I think really put it together here is, number one, identify an immediate trend. It's great, again, if the immediate trend matches your macro trend and your overall and your higher time frames. it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, I want a new, fresh move. Okay, when does that happen? Well, sometimes when you break out of consolidation, you get a new fresh buying or selling and you get that, you know, those first new waves. Um, sometimes when something just first reverses, you get those new waves. Uh, after news, and we want to get in on them pretty early. I don't want it to move up 100 ticks or something or 200 or 300 and then say, okay, I think I'm going to take this, this, this trend now. You know, you're in with the dumb money. The smart people already got in. Uh, find a low risk price pattern entry. Those are entries that you get in, maybe a pullback of some sort. Your stop is clearly behind the swing because like I said, NQ will retest swing areas over and over. You go in, well, I'm always, you know, a 10 tick stop loss. You're gonna just get stopped out on these little retests over and over. Consider the prevailing and immediate market conditions, you know. Before I go in, you know, what does the market conditions look like? Uh, I'm not going to go in and just take a setup because, well, my I have this price pattern and my EMA is doing this. Always have to look at the context of the market. Uh, know the obstacles. We covered that. Where are these little swing areas, these little support and resistance that I've mapped out on my five range and my bigger time frames and know what's going to happen when they get hit. Maybe it'll work through the area. Maybe it takes four tries, it goes up, it pops down, it goes up, and it finally clears that little barrier you drew. But know what's kind of going to happen. Uh, decide if the trade, maybe it's you know moved up a lot, but you still got some room before you hit some ba major support or resistance. Maybe you want to scalp 25 ticks. It's a little slower. Or maybe you want a larger target. You got a massive gap area. 
things are moving hard you know you don't have to be a, just a scalper you don't have to be just a you know I'm gonna only take big targets I like to do both now when I scalp I'm gonna add on more contracts I can make a 25 tick scalp earn the same amount of money as a 40 tick trade you know if I have a 20 tick stop loss and I trade four contracts it's the same as two contracts on a 40 tick stop loss so I make adjustments so I'm getting about the same profit and the same risk okay um, stay out of the market if it's really not looking good and you know I know now you know if I'm getting nervous when I'm about to take a setup because it's moving like the bars are printing up on my five range chart they're just like racing you know they're just taking off and then it's moving up and moving down I'm gonna like no no I don't care how good a price point I'm at or whatever I am staying out and here honor honor your daily loss limit and your rules with extreme discipline and I got to a point with myself you know if I can't follow my daily loss limit what kind of honorable person am I I can't follow my own rules you know, how am I going to succeed at anything if I set objectives and rules and I can't be in the spur of the moment? I can't control myself because maybe I have tension deficit, impulse disorder or whatever. You know, that's not an excuse, you know. Do not quit. Now, this one's a little controversial. I've kind of struggled with this last principle, but now in the last year or so, uh, I used to be the type where if I'm up a little bit on the day, I had a couple of winning trades, especially if I'm stressed out during my trading and I got that adrenaline going. And again, sim traders aren't going to understand this because you don't get all that adrenaline. You don't get all the stuff, but live, you know, you're live or you're trading for a combine or whatever you're doing. You know, you've got stress and you get that little bit of profit. Ha, ah, ah, ha, I am up. I, I got a little bit. I, I'm going to quit. I don't want to give it back, you know? So you quit after you're up 20 ticks. Sorry. You're up 20 ticks or so, and uh, you quit. And then you have some losing days where you're full stop out, your full drawdown, which just happens to be a lot bigger than your losing days uh, and your, your winning days. Your losing days, on average, should not be much bigger than your winning days. So. Um, you should, what I do now is I always tell myself I don't have to take another trade. I never always feel like I've got to hit a goal for the day. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about monitoring the market. If you have a two hour time slot, monitor the market and look for any great setups. And if something is like, again, hits that sweet spot, something that you know is a high probability setup, you owe it to yourself to take it. Because within any great setup and with any great market conditions, there's a distribution of wins and losses. There are going to be some that win and lose. And if you don't take all the great setups, uh, and that's assuming you didn't hit your drawdown, if you don't take those great setups, you're never going to have a big day. And you need some good winning days. You can't just have large losing days and tiny little winning days because you wanted to get rid of the stress. It takes courage. It takes a lot of, an, uh, you know, it, just keep going when your heart's beating and you just keep going so um that's just the point i believe i don't quit anymore when i just have a tiny little win i keep going doesn't mean i have to trade but i'm looking for something great and if it shows up i'm gonna take it okay uh again like i said i don't base trades basically off the two minute chart uh entirely but there are some locations that I found that tend to work out pretty good. Uh, I love a pullback to the 30 EMA, especially one where the bar doesn't close above it. Don't ask me why, but these tend to work out really nicely. Uh, I see them all throughout my charts, pullbacks. Uh, and then, of course, if we're starting to cross over, that's a nice area to start looking for longs. Uh, and again, you see these little tails. It's Price is crossing, but it never really closes. And although I don't really do this, there is an argument to be made if you want to write out some winners, and you can check charts to see this, stay in when you're seeing some really great trending days. You can write out a big runner staying in your two-minute chart until you get a couple of closing bars outside that 
30 EMA. Tends to work on really strong trending days. Again, that's not really how I trail my uh, winners, but there is an argument to be made. You can really get some huge wins doing that. All right, I'm gonna go real quickly into the actual setups themselves. If anybody's been watching any of my videos on the thread, they've seen these over and over and over. Uh, they're very simple. Here's uh, the for going short, the M formation second wave. Uh, this, what we wanna do is wait for one of those impulse waves down, a fresh new wave, a fresh downward push. You can see where you'd say, wow, this is on the move. Uh, and, I, and I really can identify that on my five range chart. I don't wanna take a spike down, right? If it's just like all of a sudden, you'll see an NQ sometimes, 80 tick spike, boom, in like a second. And it's just like some sort of order flow thing or whatever. And then it pulls back and people jump in and guess what, it doesn't work out. Don't take the spike. Uh, we're looking for a nice, you know, a good push, but not a crazy spike down. Wait for it to retrace in most cases to a previous swing high or a recent breakout area. You saw some of those areas where price had a little swing. It's nice if it comes back to that or some area just broke out of. Some cases I don't always, depends, but I don't always wait for it to pull back to a swing high or breakout area. Usually you're gonna see something that looks like an M. And there's a little bottom in the M here, This, and we're waiting for the break of that swing. It's going to look a little something like this. Um, price has been moving down with some waves. It pulls back. It's like a double test of a now resistance area. Um, sometimes I've gone in before this break by feel just we want our stop loss, that's why I go for 40 ticks. We'll generally put you above here in case it pops up and retests a few times. And we're in no later than the break of a five range bar in this area here. It's, it looks like a simple double top setup that you can see on larger time frames or whatever. It just happens to work, I see it all the time. It's a little more confirmation than our single test, which I call the A formation second wave, which is our next one. I'm not gonna read all this again. It's the same conditions, waiting for all this. Uh, some cases it doesn't have to pull all the way back. We allow now an A to form. It's a single test. You get lots of those too. It doesn't always have to test twice. This time we're waiting for the five range bar to cross the 30 EMA. We're gonna look something like this, price popping down, pulls back to here. Here's your five range bar crossing this 30 EMA. That's about where we wanna get in, stop up here. We got a little gap area here. You can get a scalp off of this. You can get a 80 tick winner, whatever. It's uh, all depends on the conditions and how much room you have. All right, these are the long setups. Uh, this is like the opposite of the M setup. It's the W, waiting again, the new fresh impulse wave. Don't want it if it just did that spike. We want the price to exit the 30 range EMA. I don't take pullbacks that haven't left the 30 range EMA on the five range chart. We want it to retrace to a swing low, mostly preferable, it doesn't have to always, or a recent breakout area. That's more confirmation than if it doesn't. Some cases it doesn't have to do that. We allow a W to form. We want the five range bar to cross for more confirmation, the swing high of the W. This is a kind of ugly W, but you'll get the idea. We've got the impulse wave popping up. We're pulling back. We test the area twice. We're entering on the five range bar and it should pop pretty nicely if you've got good momentum. Uh, and then we have, of course, the single test, which is the V. And these are, I've got hundreds of videos just showing these same trades. They work a lot. Um, same conditions as the W. Enter on the five range bar crossing the 30 EMA. Here's one I just kind of screenshot from a live trade I was in. Uh, 
moving up, nice little wave, pulls back to this area here, forms a V of sorts, we get in. And again, it sounds easy, but sometimes it moves pretty fast. You've got to be able to be ready for it to happen. Process in your mind if you like everything you're seeing and squeeze that trigger. Don't want to wait till it's up here to take the trade. Here's like a little scalp and bang. So um, hopefully that makes sense. And you're probably going, this is, this is the, you know, so simple. Again, the complexity lies in reading the market conditions in the context of the market. Now here's something I don't recommend people try until they've really practiced this either on replay or you've done a lot of sim, but it's, a, it's like kind of a fake out trade. It's a trap trader move. And it's generally when we're in a big downtrend and then you get one of these like uptrend moves and you get a couple of series of uh, upward pushes and you can see we pop up here, finds a little bit of resistance and here's a trade just like you're all been learning to do, the little V second wave, hey, we go in. Lots of people apparently like that setup too because you're starting to get, and on you know, my tick strike, I'll see like, it, it'll go to level 10. I mean, tons of people coming in here. You'll see a lot of order flow, which is why order flow can be confusing. Um, and you know there's been people, retailers up here with their stops under stuff. And so it goes up and all of a sudden I'll be watching and it'll start accelerating down really fast. And the idea is to get into here, and sometimes you won't have your stop here, but it usually will just break through here. And this is where you'll see a hundred tick move in a matter of seconds, just boom. And uh, I'll tell you, I don't recommend somebody right off the bat. It's not some one of my normal setups I use every day, but I'm getting kind of like, it's like, it's kind of a fun thing. It's like if you're playing pool, one of these little trick shots where you're rebounding off a bank and yeah, yeah, you're doing, it's, it's very counterintuitive because when you see the order flow, people see it coming in and whatever, and they just jump in. And then I don't know how or why it just slams down. And uh, so I call it, it's one of my names. I name all these things, the failed V-wave swing break reversal. That's my name I coined for that setup. Okay, uh, so those are the basic setups. There's, you know, I don't play a lot of breakouts on NQ. Uh, breakouts on NQ tend to fail, even small breakouts of small range areas, or if they don't fail, you never know which bounce is going to stop you out before it finally breaks out for real. What I do like is it to show me it's broken out, prove to me it broke out, pull back to the breakout area now, form a V or a W or a, uh, you know, an M or an A if we're going short, prove to me you broke out, pull back to the breakout area, retest it, and then, then I'll go back in that trend on my merry way. Uh, but I'm not gonna play the breakout, okay? I'm not gonna get, not on NQ. All right, let's talk about when to go for larger targets. When do I want uh, a bigger move? Well, obviously, if I'm seeing strong momentum and volatility, it's pretty easy to spot on NQ. The thing will be running up pretty quickly. Don't want crazy volatility, but what we want it. Uh, generally, you're going to see more of this in the opening 90 minutes of the U.S. session. Sometimes the opening hour, but you still get a lot of action some days, even up till 11 and beyond. Uh, but generally, this opening 90 minutes is where you're going to get most of your larger targets. Observable large swings, what does that mean? Well, if I see these moves that are moving hundreds of ticks and they're staying within my 30 EMA on my five range chart or just barely poking their head out, that's a large swing. That is showing me, and if I see these early on, I'm going, well, there's a lot of volume going on here, and if I see it earlier, there's no reason I won't see more of this. Uh, the gap areas, we've gone over that after a news release. Uh, sometimes when something comes out a heck of a lot worse than they expected, and NQ wants to do one of its classic sell-offs, uh, hang on. Targets, I believe, should be a minimum of at least 60 ticks. 
and, and believe me, that can be gotten in a matter of seconds, and up to 100 ticks or more. And I believe you really should go for these larger targets sometimes. You need to, you'll never get the full benefits of trading NQ. You might as well scalp something else. Uh, it's like having, you know, a Porsche Turbo or a or a Dodge Challenger Hellcat that's like 700 horsepower and you're, you know, driving at 60 miles an hour. You know, put some, put your foot down, test that thing out. I had a once a uh, twin turbo Lingenfelter modified Corvette, and I could tell you some cool stories on that. But anyhow, let's get to this. I'm going to show a video now of some of these larger targets, and you'll see how fast. This is in real time, uh, this trade right here. Now, this is a kind of a fake out trade. Watch this thing pop down. That's real time, okay? Most people are going to be doing what now? Oh, something happened here. I'm going for a short. Maybe it was a swing break, one of those fake outs. I knew we were in a strong uptrend, and I've watched this so many times. I go long on the V pullback. And this is in real time. This is an 80 tick target with two contracts, which means it's an $800 shot if you nail it. 40 tick stop loss. So you can see uh, it's really moving. So if somebody says, you know, I, I can't stay in a trade that long for 80 ticks. Well, come on, there's scalps that don't even take that long. Oh, you might have seen that. Uh, this is a little sort of an M pullback. It's got three tops instead of two, but um, I have an, on some of these trades an auto break even after I come up a certain amount. So I hate to be up 40, 50 ticks and then lose the trade, you know. So um, this one's about 80 ticks too. So, you know, those are two trades. Here's a, a, a nice little W type pullback. I got in slightly late, 40 tick stop loss. I'd rather be back here. There's my auto break even. This is another 80 tick target. Okay. Um, now here's something, this is a runner. This is something if I'm up really good on the week or something, I'm up good on the day. This is a 200 tick target. There's a lot of momentum going on here. Some of this is speeded up because I want to not spend too much time. I got my auto break even. It's up about 80 ticks. Now, I knew I might have some problems when I get to here. So the idea was, let me see if it can work its way through this level and get down to here. And I found that by doing a sim uh, thing that it was 200 ticks. So... Uh, and I'm just showing this, showing it's not that difficult. This, the, in real time, this is about six minutes or so to take uh, for this trade to work out. Um, I'm drawing, you can see a little line here, hoping this is a swing so I can start moving my stop. And you can see I put my stop a few ticks above the swing because you'll see it loves to retest these areas. See, I almost get stopped out there. It missed me by what, two ticks? and it starts moving back down again. This is a little bit speeded up, not a lot, but it's a little speeded up because um, it's a 200 tick move. All right, we're approaching this little area again. Pretty soon here, now I'm up uh, 125 ticks. I want to start tightening this up now that I've had a swing areas. Here's one I'm looking at to put my stop over. Gonna put it over that one. I'm just tightening this up. Pop, 200 ticks on two contracts. Nice little score. 
Okay, let's talk about when to scalp. Uh, there's times when I scalp the 25 ticks or so, looking for a little bit slower price action. I don't want that crazy volatility after 11 at least. Sometimes not even 11 is a good time to scalp. Afternoon session can give you some nice 20 to 25 tick scalp trades. Uh, Asian session, sometimes there's some nice scalp moves in there. Uh, sometimes when price already made a substantial move, I'm not looking for a big target. I've only got a little bit of room. Uh, same setups basically, but with 20 to 25 tick targets and stops. And I'll just show a quick little video on some scalps. These are 25 tick targets. Here's one I got in kind of late, uh, but some of these now are speeded up because they take a long time in the afternoon when it's not moving that well. But there's a, uh, and I'm using four contracts because it's only 25 ticks. And you can see I have the little program built into my, here's a little V-shaped uh, second wave move. So you, this is a much slower price action. And you can see the swings aren't that big. And that one almost hits the target and then starts squirming around a bit. That's why I sped this up a little. But a lot of these trades, you'll see that the 80 tick target got nailed faster than this slow 25 tick. But some people like slow. Um, and you can see it's squirming around a little, but we get it. Um, okay, so that's kind of the idea. Some of the sessions in the afternoon, 20, 25 tick scalps. Bigger targets during the day, I like to do both. I don't scalp that much, but sometimes if I didn't really, the morning was too fast or something and I get some situations in the afternoon, you know, I don't care as long as it's adding up to the same amount of ticks and all of that, it doesn't really matter. Okay, uh, we're almost at the end here. Got a couple more slides I'm gonna go over. This is the checklist of adverse conditions. These are reasons why I might not take a trade. I kind of used to have this sort of something like this, a list that I would uh, tape to my PC. I'd just quickly glance over, but you know, this, these are little questions I would ask before I go into the trade real quick. Is there excessive volatility, chaotic price movement? Did it already move a huge amount up or down? You've got to always consider auction theory. You don't want to buy at the bottom. You don't really want to, you know, buy at the bottom, buy at the top. <laughs> sell at the bottom, you don't want to do that. Uh, are we in consolidation? You know, you've got to know if price has already made a big move, it's in consolidation. Are we in a battle zone? This is something where I'd get beat up a lot. Buyers and sellers slugging it out. It's my fist fight sound effect. But what does this mean? Sometimes when you get, you, you know, price looks like it's breaking out of the low of the day. And it just says, oh, well, this thing's definitely breaking out. I'm going to go in. You go into the breakout. All of a sudden, it shoots up and bounces, you know, straight up 40, 50, 60 ticks. You get stopped out, and you're like, oh, wow, they bought off the bottom. Now it's going long. All right, I'm going to go long. And all of a sudden, you're in a long position. It turns around. It's like a gravitational pull. It's going to retest those areas. Those, you know, have, or any area of like a lot of support and resistance. I don't like it. I don't want to get in those. I don't care if it breaks out and has a big move afterwards. It's just too much hassle. There's too much, you know, heavy lifting going on, if you want to call it that. Before I take a trade, is my stop going to be able to be behind a swing? I may be in too late. I don't want my stop to be wide open where it's going to get hit with a retest. Is there a relatively clear path to my target? We make that's pretty obvious. We've talked about that. Is there, and this is the challenge here. Do we have any evidence for the current direction? Why do you think it's all of a sudden going long? Are you, how do you know it's long? That is, again, the art of the, all of this. You never really know are we in a pullback? Can I trade this? Is it scalpable retracement? Is it this? Is it that? But I like to have some idea. If I'm in a trade and I don't have any idea, it's just no direction, there's no, it's shooting up, it's shooting down, I don't want any part of it. Are we in a choppy range? 
sometimes yes you can scalp a choppy range i you know i like the highest probabilities i want to do the least predicting i want to do what i've watched on my videos on my uh sessions everything work hundreds of times i want to stick with that i'm going to go over this real quick i think money management to be honest is something i um really an individual thing it's like depends on your account size your risk tolerance but determine your max drawdown some you know some people find them too restrictive but uh, you know, find one that works for your account size, your max stop loss. Mine is never more than 40 ticks on NQ, but determine what's good for you. Uh, if I'm having these days two full stop outs in a row and I haven't hit my drawdown, uh, you know, I don't keep going with the full contract size. Lower your position size. If you guys are doing those combines, you know how strict uh, the risk is and how money management, you've really got to do that. You've got to lower your position size and don't try to win, you know, win it all back and, and just maybe it takes you a little longer to get back to even or whatever, but, but lower your contract size. Now, on the other hand, and this is kind of an aggressive thing, I find if market conditions are extremely favorable, you're having a great winning week, um, you're doing great on the day. There's times when I'll be up, let's say you're up, you know, a really good amount. I might add some contracts on for my next trade. I'll never do it where I'm going to lose for the day if the thing loses, but if it gets almost back to break even, yeah, it's a shame to lose all that money back. But if I'm not going to get hurt, I'm playing with house money, Mr. Casino Man. If I'm playing with house money, uh, I may do it and Sometimes I do that and I win some trades and I get a really nice day. And that, like I say here, this provides the ability to leverage contracts on days where great setups are plentiful and enable some large winning sessions. So again, I believe keep your losing days small in comparison with average winning days. This uh, is something that really will help you. Keep your losing days small, especially if you're in a combine. You know, lose, you know, if you have a little losing day and the market's not looking that great, just walk away, come back on a day when it's really good and pound some winners out. And that's how you, you can win some of those things. But if you take these big hits on these days, you know, those, those combines, some of them are okay, I guess, but some are like when you go to the fair, it looks so easy. You know, oh, here, you toss the ring. Oh, I got the little bear. You want the big bear, you just have to toss it right on that ring and, you know, you come back for more and, you know, all right, I'll take another month of subscription. But, you know, some of them are good and it's a good way for some people to get in there. But you have to, risk, you know, no risk management if you're going to win any of those things. All right, last slide. Uh, I use the word hacks, some NQ hacks. Uh, you know, I hear that everywhere. Dietary hacks, you know biohacking, all this, so I thought I'd be cool and put the word hack in there, like, you know, it's pretty cool, right, man? So anyhow, these are some tips, a uh, little extra, last little things to think about. In most cases, on NQ, I recommend avoiding the first 20 to 30 minutes of the U.S. market open. You can get some real crazy amateur hour, algo, whatever you want to call it, stuff in there. Uh, after the opening 30-minute range, Start analyzing that, uh, seeing what it does. Maybe you have a little more idea of the true direction, uh, especially if news doesn't come out till 10, wait for that. Um, formulate a trade strategy for long and short. What if it does this? Set, I like to have those audible alerts, like I said, at key levels in case I'm caught up in my five range. I don't notice it's hitting a really important level. And here's something that uh, I'm really giving away the farm here. This is a really, really good tip, in my opinion. Uh, pay close attention to what I call hot zone times. I used to find the ones that worked good for crude oil, and now I've kind of found ones that you know work for NQ. Often I've noticed around 10.17 to 10.20 a.m., somewhere in that time frame, and this is Eastern Standard Time, by the way, a move will show up out of nowhere. 
it'll and, and a big move and it could be a total reversal of what everything's been doing up till then um so i keep my eyes open then 10:55 to 11:05 a.m eastern standard time we, maybe some of those other markets are closing some things are happening then i'm not really sure why this one does it uh but this is a good time if nothing happens at this time keep alert between 11:17 and 11:25 sometimes a big move will happen then too but these are three time periods that doesn't happen all the time not every day but i will like if i have a setup and everything and all of a sudden some momentum comes in i look down at the clock ah oh, it's 11:20 i'm more likely to jump into that trade especially at 10:20 all of a sudden something's happening i am more likely you got to be careful though as you don't try to get into it and it's just a spike with no follow through so that you be careful with but if you can get into it on a low risk entry some of these moves tend to have follow through uh some people like to trade on sim and of course we all should do that when we're learning how to do this but don't do it like you know trade 100 contracts on sim and give yourself like uh you know a giant stop loss and this little silly thing and work on these stupid oh it's a monte carlo if i flip a coin a hundred times and all this you know take it with the same rules you do if you were live trading once you have some semblance of a system do it with the same contract size the same rules and take it seriously and have a journal for it a real serious journal don't do it like it's a video game not that there's anything wrong with that and i was thinking i noticed some of the most watched just out of uh, videos on youtube are people watching people play video games i think why not just watch somebody sim trade and make thousands of dollars on sim why doesn't anyone post those on youtube i bet that would be a big thing but uh maybe not don't have too strong a bias as not to objectively perceive real time trend changes you know in anything in life our bias can affect how we are perceiving reality and in trading if we are automatically going into a day it's only going to be a selling day and sometimes there's good reasons for that but there's other times when news comes out during the course of the sessions there's things that happen there's things that you don't know about behind the scenes and trends change and if you're like unable to squeeze the trigger because you only think it's going short you're going to miss out especially on NQ um but don't wait too long and then get in at the top of a reversal when it's moving up uh and miss all those little moves before then and then you're in too late uh i always like to do this what if scenarios throughout my thing uh while i'm trading I'm always saying, what happens if this suddenly takes off long? Where would I get in if it pulls back? Where am I going to have room? What if all of a sudden it starts moving down? What if this happens? What if it breaks out of this range? Would I take it considering always visualizing different scenarios in both directions? You know, um, here's something that's in that video. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I call it an ECM inventory uh emotional cognitive and market inventory this is especially important i do it throughout the sessions i write some things down but it's taking stock of yourself it's taking stock of your emotional uh conditions at any given moment let's say you just lost a few trades you're you know and this is people who are losing real money and they're uptight I get a lot of adrenaline when I trade. I, I wish I could get rid of that, but I get a lot of adrenaline. My heart beats. It's probably not the healthiest thing in the world. Um, and you know what? I, I have excessive fear sometimes, or I used to at least. And if you go in trading in that state, you're not, again, going to objectively perceive your setups and everything. You're trading with fear. You're trading sometimes with anger. So I like to get up away from my computer, walk around maybe do some slow breathing slow breathing if you research it calms your heart rate calms you down slow breathing and then ask myself really honestly how am i feeling am i really uptight do i really want to go in there when i'm in this condition even if i miss a trade right now 
And I got to the point where I wouldn't get in front of the computer in that state. And then cognitive, what do I mean? Are, is my brain in top form today? You know, maybe some guys came over and I, I shouldn't have done it, but because I never drink on the weekdays, but I pounded down some tequila. This is just an example, not necessarily me. And I'm just not my best, you know, uh, or the guy that drank the tequila. He's not, not Lance, he's not at his best, okay, because he pounded tequila shots. And he shouldn't have because it was a trading day. And, or he just woke up and he didn't sleep right or something happened and you're foggy. It's really good to know that. Sometimes when I'm in that foggy state, I really make a lot of mistakes. I, that's one of those times when I used to just keep going. Oh, I'm foggy. Rules, what rules, you know? And it's just like, so I take inventory of that. And then I shrink down my charts. I zoom out, I look them in and like, am I seeing like really noisy, crazy looking stuff? All right, maybe the market is off. So you want to determine early on before you lose badly, are you off? or is the market off? And uh, I go into some of that and more on that uh, video about my trading mistakes, but I think that's uh, gonna do it for today. So uh, that's it. If anybody has any questions, if there is anyone out there, uh, I'll be happy to answer anything. Hey man, you've got, you've got a wrapped audience here. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. So if you got some time, that'd be great. Oh, okay. Sure. Cool. Yeah, fantastic. Hey, guys, I did want to mention that uh, when Lance was talking about the ECM inventory, uh, there's a really good video that he put up a little while back on his thread over Futures IO. So you might want to head over there and check that out. That's one yeah, thing. I that... put the page number and stuff on one of the slides. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading that way back in the day, and uh, that definitely helped me out in a major way. So I remember uh, you wrote a nice comment. You said, that's just what I needed to see today. I remember yeah. your comment. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was kind of a game changer for, you know, so if you guys uh, have a chance, go check that out. It's definitely worth it. All right, well, let's do some Q. I didn't know you were a, I didn't know you were a sports or muscle car guy, man. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, my first car when I was 15 was a 79 Trans Am. And then <laughs> I got, you know, one that a few years ago, modified it and did stuff. But, uh, I've had some pretty quick cars, different ones, but I one of my fastest was a back in 2003, a Corvette that I had that I got brand new and sent to Lingenfelter Performance Engineering, and they did the whole thing with the twin turbos and the whole bit. And it had like this little button on it that you could control the turbo boost. And if you really wanted the full like 800 horsepower, you had to put like pump gas, uh, I mean racing fuel in it. And I'd go to a little drag place up here and it would do under 10 second quarter mile. It was pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty fast, man. We should get together and do some, uh, swap some stories over some tequila shots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you heard that part. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do some questions here, man. Uh, okay. let's see my buddy chips, 1983 on FIO. He, he'd like to know, uh, how'd you manage your size along the journey when you started getting consistent with the process? That's a good question. Um, well, you know, I I went basically started on NQ. I, I mean, does he mean going all the way back? Because I did some really ridiculous things and traded too large uh, in my Forex days. And uh, I won't even go into some of that. It's just ridiculous. But I started on NQ because this was before they had the micro contracts, which I really think most people should really start on that. But I, I traded, you know, mainly one contract for a long time and then uh, went to two contracts and uh, bumped it up. And I got all the way up to five, but then I had a couple of bad experiences. So right now I mainly trade when I start out the sessions, two contracts because I'm going for larger targets now and two contracts on a 40 tick uh stop loss or target is about $400. So if you get a couple of winners for the day and you're up 800 or so, maybe I'll bump it up to four for a trade, you know, and then if I lose, go back to the two again. But uh, probably won't go much over four and that's only if I'm up really good on the day. And if I was doing micro contracts, I'd probably start at one and then work up maybe to two. Um, 
what I like to have the ability, and that's why people that trade in combines where you can use a lot of contracts, uh, the good news is when you scalp, you can add on contracts when you're going for smaller targets and make it equal the same as if you were doing a 40 tick. But the thing that's great about NQ, you can trade it with one contract or one micro and get some of these 80 tick winners and it adds up pretty quick like that. And it just and, and if your stop loss is 40 ticks, you're you know, you've got a great win to reward ratio. And uh, so I just slowly started moving them up. If you, you know when you've moved up too fast, when you're feeling excessively fearful, that before you pull the trigger, you're just so frightened. You know, and and when you get take a loss, you're so upset. You know, you're trading too much size then, and you know. Yeah, right on. Uh, let's see. We got Love Life three sixty five. That's a that's a good handle. Uh, he'd like to know what you look for in the pre market to maybe kind of see what kind of day we might be able to anticipate. Yeah, um, I'm looking at. Basically, I'm going to read news that's specific to the NQ. I look a little bit so I can get some overall sentiment. Lately, we've been seeing a lot of things like the NQ has been moving down and the Dow has been moving up. Uh, and that's mainly because of the bond yields and because of the higher borrowing costs, the technology stocks are reacting a little differently. So that's just an example of reading some news that uh, of course, I look at the futures before it opens. If I see we're already way down, I'm not going to get a tremendous bias, but if we're down 300 points on NQ, it could be a pretty bad day. Um, I'm going to mark off all those areas of support and resistance on, you know, if I can't find where some of the areas, sometimes you have to go all the way to really high charts because it takes you all the way back several months if you're at you know, really serious lows of the day. So I've got to research, you know, if I'm looking back two months and I still don't see where my next level of support is, I may have to go back five months or something and then write those down. Because if I break through some of these levels of support and I still want to go short, or, you know, I, I really want to know where those areas are. So I'm going to look at that. I don't do a lot of volume profile, although I'm not averse to maybe looking into it more. I kind of look at certain areas and just look at my charts where things bought and sold and, and I can see where something really moved up and no thousands of orders came in at this spot and then this spot. Uh, and and like I said in the, the thing, I'm looking at areas where there's gaps, where there's no support or resistance. You're going to find those gaps there when you have a big surge overnight and you'll see that there's big broad spaces where there's no support or resistance. So I'm looking for that. So I'm putting it all together. And of course, what news is going for the day, you know? Yeah, cool. Uh, it looks like, you know, you pretty much just enter and exit without doing any type of uh, scaling out and scaling in. Hitting 993 would know would like to know why that is. Yeah, I've done both. Um, I've just gotten to the point where and I did a little bit more of that on crude oil for a period, and I think it worked pretty well. Um, I have found that I've kind of at the point where if I see a good setup, I really want to get in on a certain trade location, and I want to go all in. And the problem with NQ is that it has such big bounces and pullbacks that if you break even too quickly and you start scaling out and, you know, let's say I want to take off a little part of my position and break even, because most people do that. They're up like 30, 40 ticks. Okay, I'm going to break even and take off a part of my position and maybe let it run. Um, a lot of times it'll just curl back up and take out my break even stop. Because even if you're up 40 ticks, it can go right back and take out your stop. Doesn't mean the trade was would have been a loser. So now I've only made about half of what I would have made uh, because I've only one on half of the position. And uh, I found an NQ, I just really like going all in and all out. And I've gotten to where I kind of know when I want to use a bigger target. And on a 40 tick move that, and let's face it, when I'm scalping for, and I call it a scalp for 40 ticks, you see that those happen in, you know, sometimes a few seconds. 
uh, I don't really want to be worrying about scaling out and scaling. It happens too fast. And that, that, you know, if I'm in, and you could see even on the 200 tick target, um, it just, I like to have, if I'm going to go in with a certain amount of risk, I want to have a certain amount of reward and know what it's going to be. And I, there's nothing wrong with scaling in and out. Um, and if somebody likes that, I just don't do it personally. I think on other instruments, I would. There is some instruments that don't move the same way, that don't have those bounces and pullbacks, where it makes a lot of sense to, hey, this trade's working out good. I'm going to build up a position around this price level. And when price pulls back, I'm going to add more contracts on. And then I'm going to peel some off before. I, I think it's a great idea on something maybe like the ES or uh, some other instruments. And maybe it works good on NQ, but because of how fast it is, it gets a little frustrating not to get the full amount uh, that I want. But there's, I think a lot of big traders and then, you know, really good traders do that. They scale in and they scale out. So, and I'm not saying I'm a great trader, so maybe they're right, but on this particular thing, I prefer to go all in, all out. Yeah, I can see why. I'm a scale and fool on ES, but man, watching NQ, just like, yeah, okay. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ready to go. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, PA Trader 65, how do you prevent yourself from overtrading on both on winning and losing days? That's a really good question. Um, and that's something that I have done both of uh, for many years. Um, over trading on a losing day is even worse, I guess, but they're both kind of bad. Um, it's by, again, only having the ability to recognize those really good setups and really good market conditions. And of course, knowing what times of the day are best uh, and only taking the setups that I really think are really going to work out. Now, of course, mo they don't always work out, but they are some, and I've found that have a much higher probability than others. So just because you're winning a couple of trades doesn't mean you're going to keep winning. And of course, even though I said don't quit too early with a tiny profit, I don't mean necessarily You've got to understand how markets move, number one. You're going to see these uh, phases where we're in consolidation. And then all of a sudden, price expands and it starts making a move. You can see either buyers or sellers are coming in, and then you get a couple of waves of that. And then, you know, sometimes people will win those trades. They, they have beautiful trades. They go in. They catch that nice little pullback. They get in. They take the second pull back and they win on that one and you end up winning two or three trades in a row. Guess what? You know, that that thing just spent itself for a while. It may now go into a choppy phase. You may have already hit the best moments of that move and you don't want to keep going now. Uh, you want to just kind of, you know, once it's made, I'm not, I don't know Elliott wave theory perfectly, but I know there's some good things in there about after a certain wave count that, you know, it can consolidate and then pull back and move down the other way. So you want to know the phases of the market, the cycles, and, and try to get in on that initial momentum of a new fresh move and then not keep trading after the move's already gotten, if that makes any sense. So if you're losing a lot, of course, what stops you from over trading on a losing day is having a pretty tight uh, daily loss limit. There's going to be times when you, you're not going to want to quit. But if you've established for a good enough reason to save your account or you're doing a combine that your loss limit has to be pretty tight, you have to just, you know, you can't over trade, obviously, or you're going to, you know, if you go beyond the loss limit. And uh, if you're winning, I say monitor the market. Don't necessarily say I'm going to have a goal. I don't. I don't go in saying I've got to make you know this amount of money every day or this amount of ticks. I don't think that's good because you're going to force things. I'm just going to monitor, and it's like, oh, there's my setup. It's coming back to a price I like. It's moving fast, but it's not moving too fast. It's uh, it's really nice, and I like that setup. And maybe I should take it. I hate to lose back since I'm up pretty good on the day. But if I don't take during the week, 
you know, there's going to be so many good setups that present themselves. And like I said, there's an even distribution, not an even, but there's a distribution of wins and losses, even in a great setup. There's going to, so sometimes to get to the wins, you have to be willing to take a little hit and, and be able to, but that way you can have some days where you're making really big winning days. And they will, that, you have to have some small losing days, some small winning days, maybe a break even day, and then a couple of pretty good sizable winning days. That's the only way you really build up an account or get good in the long run. Otherwise, you just spin your wheels. At least that's been the experience for me. And I never had the courage for a long time to keep going and have those winning days. So you have to know when to keep going, but you don't want to over trade and trade in lousy market conditions. Right on. That's a great perspective. All right. I think we got time for one more. Brock would like to know. Uh, he's Brock says he's been seeing a wider bid ask spread on the NQ recently, even during active times, and he wants to know if uh, the spread factors into your decision making. Uh, I. I've noticed that a little bit too, but it's not like I experienced in Forex when I go into a trade and I'm several ticks down. It doesn't work that way. Now, it may manifest in if I hit a market order being not exactly in the position I want to be in, but I haven't if you're seeing that, you're generally probably at a very volatile time or news could be coming out or afterwards. I I haven't really looked, you know, I'm usually watching my charts and I'm not looking so much at a dome or, a, or the bid and ask. I really don't look that much at it, to be honest. I'm just looking for those price pattern setups and the acceleration. I mean, I can tell my tick strike is kind of giving me a good idea of the order flow. But um, if I started going into several trades and finding myself down the minute I hit the button, I'd know something was off and I'd probably stay out for a while and look at the, the bid and ask spread. Right on. Guys, uh, there's a few more questions that have been posted here, and I'm not going to be able to get to them today, but I will post them over on the thread at Futures.io, so check it out later. Lance will get over there and hopefully answer those for you. Lance, you're pretty good at this, man. We should do it again. Oh, I had a great time. It's yeah. really the first one I've ever done, but I really enjoyed it. The whole idea is just somebody, maybe you find one or two little things that help you because, you know, like I said, on the on the, I've, I've gotten a lot of things I use from the, the forum, from Futures.io. So I think it's good for people to pay it forward and share whatever they've learned. Right on, man. Thanks you. Thanks for giving back. It's really good, appreciated. Uh, guys, that's about a wrap. We don't have anything scheduled for next week, but you will want to be here on March 31st. We've got two big hitters on deck with trading psychologist extraordinaire Dr. Brett Steenbarger and volume profile, the master himself, Morad Asker, a.k.a. FT71. You're not going to want to miss one. It's going to be great. Uh, also, don't forget, please hit that like button over on YouTube. Head over to Futures.io to, to uh, continue the conversation with Lance and participate for free in the Battle Stations Challenge. Again, I thank you for joining us and trade well.